Coming up on American Medicine Today, most people will come down with an illness as they age, but most common diseases can actually be reversed. Dr. Terry Shantani shares some of the easiest food habits to change, along with his latest book, The Peace Diet. Next, Julia had degenerative pain, which led to her undergoing a fusion surgery in her hometown. Still in terrible pain, she heard about the Bonatti Spine Institute from a friend. And after undergoing the Bonatti procedures, she is happy to return to her active life pain-free. Then Dr. Bonatti talks about the latest Trump indictments, along with special guest Christian Watson, host of the Pence of Politics podcast. Are these baseless accusations against Trump having the effect Democrats were looking for? Find out coming up on American Medicine Today. Featuring cutting-edge science and medical innovation, touching personal stories of recovery from pain, along with political, social, and health care issues plaguing our nation. This is American Medicine Today, brought to you by the Bonatti Spine Institute and Alfred Bonatti, MD. Welcome to American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Bonatti, alongside Ethan Euchre and world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Alfred Bonatti. So at some point in our lives, we all face illness, but our next guest says that many common diseases can actually be reversed. We'd like to welcome to the show Dr. Terry Shintani, award-winning medical doctor and nutritionist who was actually declared a living treasure back in 2006, one of the youngest individuals to ever receive this designation. Thank you and welcome to the show, Dr. Shintani. Thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate it very much. You have several books out, including The Hawaii Diet, The Peace Diet, Mm -hmm. and Eat More, Way Less. Can you tell us about those concepts? After medical school, I was very, uh, how should I say, disappointed that they didn't teach us more about nutrition. And so I went and got a degree in nutrition from Harvard after medical school because I thought that uh, it it wasn't right that... uh, Uh, most of the diseases that we suffer from uh, are nutrition-related diseases like diabetes and hypertension, high cholesterol, heart disease. So I got a a degree in nutrition, came back, and I decided when I practiced medicine that that would be a primary focus. Well, when I got back to Hawaii, I became, well, actually, I've been aware that uh, we have a big problem with uh, obesity in the native population. So I conducted a program uh, where we put See, the pictures of ancient Hawaiians, they're all slim and healthy and athletic looking. And today we have one of the most uh, overweight populations in the country, maybe in the world. With I had patients that were 300, 400, 500 pounds. And so I, I did a research project where I showed what would happen if we put them on their old traditional diet. And they, uh, they all lost weight. Uh, they didn't have to count calories and so that was the basis of uh, my uh, my first concept that was um, eat more to weigh less. We actually published a paper showing that people would eat more food if they ate traditional low-calorie density food, but the calorie count would drop. And so that was the basis of uh, my first book, The Eat More, Way Less Diet. And then later on, I got a national publisher to publish my Hawaii diet book, And then my latest book is The Peace Diet, which kind of updates uh, everything and modernizes uh, the the concept so that anyone can use use the diet approach. So that's kind of a thumbnail sketch of how how all of that went. Hmm. And you were talking about different things people could be doing to kind of ward off or fight against cancer. That was probably the reason I became a doctor. When I was six months old, my father got cancer. Hmm. And uh, I didn't know it. I was a little, I was an infant at the time. But later on, when I became aware that my dad had a colostomy and they had taken out the left side of his colon, I asked mom, when are they going to cure dad? And I became very acutely aware that modern medicine didn't have an answer for for cancer. But going forward, uh, it bothered me that there wasn't a good answer for cancer. So I started looking at uh, not only um, conventional modern medicine, uh, which I think is important, but I started looking at what they call uh, alternative medicine or integrative medicine. And so, and and by the way, nutrition was part of that. I thought that was crazy that that would be considered 
alternative medicine, but right. I, th I think that should be mainstream medicine that we use nutrition first. Uh, but that's how I got into looking at uh, different approaches to cancer. And uh, I have several patients in my practice that were declared terminally ill stage four cancer that uh, uh, we've been able to turn around using uh, a holistic, um, you know, whole person approach using nutrition and supplements, <laughs> uh, et cetera. I've spoken to many people who have unfortunately gotten the cancer diagnosis and they have always been very big on on trace minerals and going back to um, just elements to really just help them become better. So I've I've always been fascinated that myself. Yeah. And you even say here how so many common illnesses can be reversed. So right. how how sure. can people do that? How can they uh, at least be given really a fighting chance? Well, um, you know, I um, uh, the the cancer issue. I you know, I I actually have a, an hour long lecture uh, on my website peacediet.org where they can they can get a uh, I have a free ebook and I have um, an introduction to my cancer lecture. What I explain in there is the lecture is about seven steps or seven ways to control cancer. And uh, for for cancer to develop, to develop, it takes about seven steps from a normal cell to a cancerous cell, and that includes uh, um, uh, DNA damage. And uh, there's a concept of apoptosis where the cancer is supposed to uh, commit suicide. Uh, and if it doesn't do that, then you have a cancerous cell that goes into malignant transformation. And then you have this the stage where your your body is supposed to your immune system is supposed to take over and if that does if that fails then you have to try to starve the cancer by um by taking away growth factors and do that by avoiding things like sugar and uh, now they find that methionine which is an amino acid feeds cancer and um uh and inflammation and th those are they're very but at each the point is that each step you can do something to slow or possibly even reverse the process. And that includes things like diet and lifestyle. And uh, you don't want to eat sugar because sugar will trigger insulin and insulin will cause cancer growth. And you don't want to do too much animal protein because that triggers IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor. And I'm also pr probably in Hawaii, I'm best known for, for inducing not only weight loss, but getting control of diabetes. I was in Newsweek because a reporter asked how long it takes for me to turn diabetes around. <laughs> and some of, some of my patients, I get them off of insulin in, in as little as five days. Wow. And, five days. Uh, oh, my goodness. How is that possible? <laughs> but no, the, the thing is, you have to know what you're doing. Um, uh, because um, a lot of they, they're really surprised because I do that with a high carbohydrate diet. And the. I, I actually wrote another book called The Carbohydrate Revolution um, because people, I, most people, even professionals, misunderstand carbohydrates. Uh, when it's refined, it does, it raises your blood sugar. But when you have whole unprocessed carbs, they actually help you control blood sugar. And it, it, it's, it's a complex process, but um, people are just really surprised that I, I fed people a 70% carbohydrate diet and their blood sugar goes down. Hmm. And that's because uh, I'm using the right kinds of carbohydrates. The problem is in the U.S., carbohydrates are all mostly processed. Mm -hmm. And then it hits the bloodstream too fast. And that's what makes carbohydrates bad. Not, not that they're inherently bad, but the fact that most of the carbs we eat in the U.S. are processed into this fine granulated flour. And then it hits the bloodstream too fast. And it's the speed at which they hit the bloodstream that's really the problem and not the fact that it's a carbohydrate. It's like mainlining carbohydrates, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which yeah, mainlining yeah, exactly. anything and, and is actually when, never a good thing. No, and, and actually, when you look at the, the slimmest populations with the least amount of diabetes, they're eating lots of carbs, but they're not eating all those, you know, pastries and right. and uh, uh, sugar drinks and, you know, those 
the kinds of things that we find very commonly in in uh, the American diet. Well, we need to hear more about this on upcoming episodes. I'm sure we'll have you back. Dr. Terry Shantani, thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Make sure you stay tuned. Coming up after the break, a story of recovery. Don't be screwed by lesser spine institutes who bait you with minimally invasive procedures, then switch to screws, rods, disc replacements, and hardware. At Bonatti, no metal hardware fusions are ever used. Bonatti invented the precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Bonatti spine procedures, they consistently reflect 98.75% patient satisfaction. Over half our patients have suffered from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. Julia of Schnellville, Indiana, is an active woman that enjoys a wide variety of activities. I used to work for the Postal Service. I loved to jet ski and I loved to scuba dive. And we even rode motorcycles, uh, each having our own because I didn't want to wait on him. I wanted my own. All of those things were gone after the back pain, so I pretty much just read. Julia attributes years of hard, physically demanding work at the post office as the cause of her pain. I did work for the Postal Service, and it required that you lift bags that could be up to 70 pounds. Later years, when I became postmaster, I had to sit at the computer. Working in a small office, I did um, everything from cleaning to shoveling snow. I emptied all the heavier bags. And when I stopped working, that actually the thing that was hurting me the most was sitting at the computer and leaning forward. Julia's pain made even the most mundane everyday tasks difficult. It hurt brushing my teeth and leaning forward. It hurt washing dishes. I hurt just trying to bend over. I'd be so slow trying to pick up something on the floor. Over three decades, Julia has tried numerous treatments to eliminate her pain, but none of them helped, and some even made it worse. I would go to the chiropractor like four days a week so I could stand up straight. I went to uh, physical therapy, I believe it was about eight months, and I would go before I was due to go to work at 7.30 in the morning, and they would have me on the exercise bike, and have me doing arm strengthening uh, exercises, and then they would have me go into a room where they put a chain up under me and something up and something like under my arms and something lower, and, and they would stretch me, and it that actually hurt worse until one day I couldn't get back off the table afterwards, and then they decided, oh, I needed surgery. Julia had traditional open back surgery near her home, requiring her to endure more agonizing physical therapy as part of her recovery. After an unfortunate accident at home, she was forced to have surgery again. I did the first surgery. Um, I had a bulging disc, and so then they had me come back and had me doing therapy in water, which I couldn't hardly step. I had accidentally re-hurt myself just trying to rinse out the tub and kind of twist it around, and I needed surgery a second time within a month. As time progressed, so did her pain. While on vacation, she realized she needed more help and traveled to see spine specialists in and around her hometown. We went down to New Orleans, and that first night there, I found I started hurting. I couldn't lay in a bed. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, my husband would put luggage up under my knee, and it ended up that I slept in a chair for 10 and a half months. And then finally, I went up to Carmel, Indiana, the Indiana Spine Group, and they gave me a shot in my spine, and that was the first time I was able to sleep in a bed again. And then he also did a rhizotomy on me. But I continued doing that for 10 years, and then it quit working. Julia learned about the Bonatti Spine Institute from a friend who was also a past recipient of the targeted Bonatti Spine procedures. Well, we had a good friend. We found out that he had went down here to have back surgery. Of course, I thought it was odd. I was like, wow, don't they have any places around here? You know, but then he started talking to me how he had went to all these doctors. A lot of doctors had been similar to what I had went to and was told there was no hope for me. My back was shot. 
and he spent two hours telling us everything that he went through. And I noticed he was standing at this table doing stuff, and and I said, do you need to sit down? You know, I didn't understand that he could stand up so long. Upon seeing the positive outcome of her friend's surgery, she decided to call and see if she was a candidate for the exclusive Bonatti spine procedures. Hearing she needed an MRI to send in for review, she went back to her primary care physician. My primary care doctor gave me the MRI on, and told me on a Friday that uh, my L5 was bad, but I didn't have any nerve compression, so do not have surgery. Well, at that point, my husband was helping me out of a chair, and I couldn't stand for very long, couldn't hardly walk. And then by Monday, Dr. Bonatti himself called me and was saying exactly where my pain was, telling me where I hurt. And I said, yes, you know, he knew that I was having numbness in my feet. And he said, are you losing your balance a lot? And it had, it has been happening a lot where all of a sudden I'll just stagger after standing very long. So it, it, I was impressed just by him knowing where I was, where my primary care doctor for years, he wouldn't acknowledge I had spine pain. On her in-person evaluation day, Julia received additional MRIs and x-rays at the on-campus imaging center. Just a short while later, a surgeon met with her to discuss her symptoms and design a customized surgical plan to eliminate the source of her pain. They had me follow the MRI signs to get to the x-ray center. It wasn't very far to get to, and um, they were really quick. It was like the, they had the x-ray images immediately to look at. But a lot of times when uh, I have x-rays taken, uh, a doctor may have a nurse call me and um, you really don't hear too much about the results. The patented Bonatti spine procedures are performed incrementally using conscious IV sedation, where the patient remains awake and communicating with their surgeon to ensure the source of their pain is eliminated before they leave the operating table, although not everyone remembers the experience. Then my anesthesiologist told me, no, I was talking the whole time, and even uh, that was you I looked at, and you said, yes, I was talking and, and doing the movements. Julia, like many after their Bonatti spine procedures, is surprised at how quickly she was able to be up and walking so soon after surgery. They, they recommend it for me to walk, do a lot of walking. The first day I did walk right off and um, I noticed I was walking straighter and faster than I had for a long time. I feel like when I'm walking, I'm not hurting. I would recommend the Bonatti Spine Institute to any of my family and friends. Now Julia is looking forward to returning to her active lifestyle, starting with a short vacation, all pain-free. I'm looking forward to going on vacations and being able to get out and walk. We arrived here Sunday and we're leaving Friday. Um, try to spend a couple days in uh, Daytona Beach. I think everybody was shocked, like, really, you had surgery today? I had a drain tube. I was at my desk doing payroll for 200 employees, worked till night, got up, went to bed. Actually, the recovery was great. I mean, I really immediately felt the difference. I was able to go back to work within a couple of days. The progress after each procedure was amazingly good. The recovery, all told, has been phenomenal. Six days after surgery, I was back in the gym slowly but surely working my way back to back to fighting, back to, back to basically 100% of fighting, you know? So six days and everybody was in awe, like, didn't you just get out of surgery? I'm like, yeah, I feel great. I was rolling with everybody and I'm in the advanced class. First time I came in here was Monday and today is Thursday. I've had two surgeries and am doing fantastic. I'm still in shock that I can walk. That's all within four days. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. Welcome back to American Medicine Today. So with the latest indictments of former President Trump in Georgia, the left's witch hunt to keep him from office shows no sign of slowing down. 
But is each new charge actually making Trump more popular? Well, joining us to discuss just that is Christian Watson, political commentator and host of Pensive Politics podcast channel on YouTube. Thank you for joining us, Christian. Thank you for having me. Why don't you tell us about, you know, these latest charges from your home state of Georgia against President Trump and 18 of his allies. Now, there's four different indictments, all in different cities, and they've been filed in all five months. Mm -hmm. I mean, if people don't think this is a weaponization of our justice system, I mean, they're completely insane. I think that the indictment is filed in faulty legal premises, and the faulty legal premises are very simple. I actually go over four of them in my commentaries on this. I'll go over four of them today. Mm -hmm. The first premise is that Trump lost the election in 2020. So the second, second premise is that Trump knows he lost the election in 2020. The third premise is that Trump knows he lost the election in 2020 and then undertook that action to overtake and overturn a legitimate process. Mm-hmm. And then the last premise, which they really need for this entire conspiracy RICO charge to make sense, mm-hmm. is that Trump knows he lost, his allies know he lost, his lawyers know he lost, and then also undertook a illegitimate process to overturn the election. The fact that Trump said that he did not lose the presidency is true, and we know that. All America, everybody knows that this is a cop-out of the left to try to eliminate something that they were responsible and that they commit fraud. That fraud never was proved because we have a terrifying bad legal and political system that cooperate on the charade. And he's fighting that. And nobody is accountable and trying to make him accountable of a lie. Now, the the second premise is disproven very simply because Trump does not believe he lost. And so if Trump does not believe he lost, you can't really say, as the indictment says, the 96 plus page indictment says, you can't really say that these people falsely and illegally submitted statements in furtherance of a conspiracy because there is no conspiracy. Trump used the proper means, the legal means and the uh, social means using media to advocate for his vision of the election. And therefore, that means that there was at least a genuine belief on his part. And it is perfectly, perfectly legal to advocate for a legal position and to advocate for a position, a moral position in the media. Now, why is this happening? That's the more important question. I think that it's all too easy for us to default to the narrative that there's a two-tiered system of justice. There has, There is, but there's been that for a while, for decades, actually. Yes. Go back and look at the FBI's operations in the 60s with COINTELPRO and how they literally quashed dissent, how they killed people they didn't like, how they arrest people they didn't agree with. This has been happening for years. The bigger problem is this. Fannie Willis, who is an avowed progressive, has no allegiance to the first principles of our republic, has no allegiance to the moral philosophy that founded America. She has an allegiance to progressive legal ethics. And progressivism, as it relates to the law, does not view the law as a means to decide certain principles. It views the law as a tool to advance the goals of particular economic and social classes. Fannie Willis is indicting Trump. Because it goes with, it goes perfectly in line with her progressive philosophy that social causes are more important than eternal principles. We have to root out these anti-American ideas, which have been festering in our system for over 130 plus years. The progressive era was not that long ago. It was actually 130 plus years ago. And it has literally terraformed the um, landscape of our country, the deep state. That's a relic of the progressive era. That if, without the progressive era, you don't have the administrative state. Uh, So many of the things, the welfare state, so many of the things that are attacking the American spirit come from this foul era in American history. And Fannie Willis is simply a long product of that very long process that made its way throughout our history. So we have to really look at this stuff from a wide angle because that's the only way we're going to be able to defeat this menace if, if we confront it at its source. The citizens, they need to take action. The citizens, they need, and I'm not talking about Democrats or Republicans. Mm -hmm. I think everybody knows that this is a criminal behavior and is a weaponization of the justice. And if the Justice Department is acting like that, something needs to be corrected. And the problem is we are quiet, doing nothing, and that is a mistake because then we are going to become in a type of a country 
that is practically a communist country, we will practically be servants of a small group of individuals that they are going to rule us. We have to understand that in America right now, there is a power structure that doesn't just work in favor of the left. It works in favor of anyone and everyone who has access to it. That means people on both the left and the right have access to this power structure. It's called the Uniparty. And the Uniparty stand against President Trump. The Uniparty stand against anyone who has a pro-American agenda. The Uniparty stands against anyone who has critical thinking as it relates to government. The Uniparty simply wants to further the entrenched interests that happen to dominate our system, ranging from the military industrial complex, ranging from the pharmaceutical industry, ranging from and all manner of interest that happened to control our political system. And they wish to keep those alive while keeping anything that might threaten that current order, that current political order out of the system. We have to view this, this indictment as a microcosm of a broader phenomenon, because if we do that, I think we're going to have the ability to fight it much better than if we simply view it as uh, a, a thing in itself, so to speak, as they would call it in, in philosophy. So, you know, I think that it's true that this is an attempt to, uh, this is a sham attempt to discount Trump, disqualify Trump, but it's happening within the context of broader forces that, that really go beyond this one incident and really span across several areas in our current political conversation. Christian, about a minute left. Um, any predictions on the outcome, not only of these indictments, but how much it's going to affect uh, the campaign, of course, Trump's campaign, the campaign in general, as far as the GOP is concerned, by all accounts, it looks like people are becoming even more sympathetic towards Trump. Obviously the MAGA crowd and whatever they, that's what they want to call those people, those people, the deplorables, um, are always going to support Trump, but it's, I, I, I see it actually switching a lot of independents who were undecided over to, uh, president Trump's side. What are your thoughts, uh, as we close out this segment? Yeah, we don't, we'll see. It, it appears that if every other indictment has just made his poll numbers either remain steady or go up. So I don't know. I'm not a prophet, so I don't make predictions. I don't do that. In fact, that's actually one of the problems of our system that people make predictions too much. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to get involved in, in the deal of prophecy. That's God calls particular people for that. He didn't call me for that. So, <laughs> but I will. But I will say, I'll, I'll say this though. Fair enough. The more you throw fire on, you, you throw kerosene on the fire, the bigger the fire gets, and the elites know that. And that's what they fear the most. Mm. Thank you so much for being on the show, Christian Watson, political commentator and uh, host of Pensive Politics Podcast on YouTube. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thanks, Christian. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Appreciate it. It. Take great care. Thank you for watching American Medicine today. If you have any comments or questions, contact us at the numbers below. Or you can tweet at Dr. Benati using the hashtag American Medicine Today or hashtag AMT. We would like to hear from you. 